All right, in this video, I want to talk about a pair of false doctrines that come together to put the Christian to sleep, to put their fire out, and make them lukewarm. And the first one here is soul sleep. I'm just going to briefly go over this because I've already made videos about this, where they believe that when you die, you're just sleeping because of the references to Jesus saying, oh, she's not dead, she sleepeth, Tabitha, get up, right? Or he says to about Lazarus that he's just sleeping, and they're like, well, if he's sleeping, well, then what's the big deal? And he goes, he's dead, right? So they reference death to being asleep, and they don't realize that what Jesus is saying is the physical body is sleeping, right? And he's equating basically when you fall asleep at night, you are dead physically, right? But spiritually, you are still alive, right? And it's kind of a reference to having faith in God and his word that even though you're, you're going to lay down and die every night, God's going to raise you up to life in the morning. But even in between that time where you go to sleep and you wake up, you go to like a dream world, right? You're not dead in the sense that you're no longer existing. Matter of fact, there's times where you can have very vivid and lucid dreams where you know you are dreaming and you go through the world and do whatever it is you do. But your body is sleeping or dead, right? I've gotten in other videos where I get into this in more detail. So what I want to really focus on is annihilationism. This is the other doctrine that is false that comes together with soul sleep to put Christians into a slumber themselves. So that even though they're alive, they're dead. They need to bring themselves back to life. And it puts their fire out, makes them lukewarm. So I want to do this video about annihilationism versus eternal torment. And their argument is that God is love and merciful and graceful and that he's just going to completely annihilate those who reject him. They're going to burn up each one according to their sins. So some will burn longer and more painfully than others, but everybody's going to be burned up and just annihilated eventually. They don't really have a time frame of like how fast it would happen to some people or how long it would take for some people. But that's basically how they describe annihilation. And they talk about it because of things like Jesus saying uh, about the second death, right? The first death for your body, the second one for your soul. And your soul also dies, like the body, it's just gone, right, into dust. Or where Jesus says that he will destroy both body and soul in hell. Or being cast into a lake of fire. And there's, they're being destroyed, destruction, right? So they make that argument. But at the same time, this argument is coming from these legalistic people. Right, like the Seventh Day Adventist and branch off groups from the Seventh Day Adventist Church, who are very gung ho about you being under the letter of the law, specifically the Ten Commandments. And it's strange because of how much they preach about obeying the law and about how sin is evil and how you really need to love God and love your fellow man, yet they make sin very light. Like, not a big deal, right? Any sin that you commit has beaten, humiliated, and crucified Jesus. Adam and Eve just ate from some fruit, and it caused Jesus to have to be beaten, humiliated, and to give up the ghost on the, on the cross, right? So, even something you think is insignificant has an eternal consequence that only God can pay for because he is eternal. Sin is not just a whoop-de-doo 
oh, I'm just going to burn up for a short period of time. This is like the Catholic purgatory where they think, oh, I killed Jesus with my sin, but uh, I'm special. I'm different from other sinners. I'm going to go to purgatory where I only have to burn for a little while, but everybody else has to burn forever in hell to pay for their sin because, you know, sin has eternal consequences. So you're going to burn forever. But I'm Catholic. I'm special. I'm only going to burn for a little while. I don't know how long, but it's not as long as everybody else. Well, Seventh-day Adventist and like-minded groups think that you'll burn up for a little bit of time based on your sin in your life if you've rejected Jesus. And it's like, but each sin makes you guilty of breaking the whole law. Each sin killed Jesus. That's an eternal consequence. They make very light of sin. They even go to the point of basically saying, as long as you're not in habitual sin in that you're not doing the same sin over and over, even though if you continue to sin at all, you're a habitual sinner. Even if your sins are different each time you sin, you're still habitually sinning. But they like to put it into a different category of like, oh, you're habitually sinning, so you keep doing the same thing, such as you're addicted to a drug, right? So you keep doing the same sin. You haven't repented of it and turned from it. It can be something that's not necessarily considered addiction, but like kleptomania or uh, lying, you know, compulsive lying. There's people who are addicted to doing such things. And they were like, oh, th these people are bad. They're real sinners. If your sin is not like that, well, then you're better than them. And uh, you actually deserve to be forgiven because you're actually not habitually sinning, even though their sin puts them in the same boat. They, they make a distinction. They're in the same boat with every sinner, but they put themselves in a special category. They're not as bad as the other sinners. And they don't realize that they are just as bad as the other sinners. That what they've done has humiliated and beaten and crucified Jesus just as much as whatever anybody else has done. Whether you look at somebody who's a, a pedophilic, child-sacrificing Satanist that uh, rapes and does homosexual sex magic and all these crazy things, you're just as bad as they are. But they like to make light of sin as if, well, when I sin, it's no big deal. But when you sin, it's the biggest deal in the world, right? I do these sins that makes me guilty of breaking the whole law. But you, you're not keeping Saturday as a Sabbath rest for your physical body. So you're the worst of sinners and you're going to you're gonna be annihilated because of that. And it, they're, the way they see things is just very distorted. Where they're trying to make, yeah, you need to stop sinning. All while they make sin, well, it's not a big deal. You know, as long as you're not habitually sinning and you're, in, even if, you know, you're not end up forgiving, you're just going to be burned up for a while and you'll just no longer exist. This takes the fire out of a Christian. And it's strange because these people will preach the fear of God. You need to fear God. And they'll complain about you preaching the gospel. You're preaching saved by grace through faith. And they're saying, you're taking the fear of God away. And it was like, what? But you're teaching that sin's not a big deal because as long as you're not habitually sinning and you just confess and repent of it, uh, it's not a big deal. And even if you're not end up going to be forgiven, you're just burned up and no longer exist. Uh, that does not make me fear God at all. That makes God look very light on sin. It's not a big deal. But when you preach grace, you're making a big deal about sin. A very big deal. Because you're saying sin is such a big deal that even the littlest of sins makes you unworthy of heaven and you deserve hell. And that's why you need Jesus to pay for your sin. Because it's the only way you can be saved. That's how bad sin is. Just the littlest of it damns you forever. Not, not just because you're the worst of sinners or you're a habitual sinner, but that you sin at all. You see, the people that Jesus actually justified were those who were saying that they are sinners. Right? It, being a sinner is not somebody who has sin, but somebody who sins. Right? 
If you're a, if you've lied in the past, okay, you lied. Doesn't mean you continue to lie. But if you're a liar, that means you continue to lie, right? Just like if you say if you had sinned, you sinned in the past. But if you're a sinner, you continue to sin. And he talks about the two people who go to the temple. The one saying, oh, thank you for not making me like this sinner over here, Lord. And, you know, it's so great for what you've done for me. And thinking that he's all good and gold and dandy and whatnot. And then the other guys just come to God going, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because he knows he can't measure up. He understands sin and how it's an issue and how it's a big deal. And Jesus says he went away justified. Right? So, where Jesus says he's come to save sinners, not the righteous, right? Sinners are people who sin. They, they're in a state of continuing to sin. Or else they would just be people who have sinned, did sin. No, they're sinners. We all are. Just some of us admit it and some of us don't. Right? So, just this making light of this sin is, is just deranged where they don't see this. But it, it makes sense because a lot of these people are Seventh-day Adventist and branch offs of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they believe that they are the seventh church in Revelation. They are the Laodicean church. And a lot of them are very proud about this and boastful of this. Like, yeah, well, we're part of that church. And as long as we're part of that last church, we're good, right? And it's just the same mentality that they rebuke the Catholics for. But, oh, we're part of the Catholic church. We're part of that original church. As long as we're part of that church, we're golden. And they rebuke the Catholics. But they have that same mindset here. Well, as long as you're part of the light, O.C. in church, you're good, you're golden, right? But there's nothing good to say about this church at all. I think every church that is mentioned has at least one thing that Jesus says that, hey, keep this thing going that you're doing. He has something to commend him for. But this one has nothing good to say about it. Nothing. He said, the first thing he mentions about them is they're not cold or hot. They are lukewarm. And part of this is because of this doctrine of soul sleep and annihilation. You see, if you think that, oh, when you die, like if you were to die right now, that your soul just sleeps and waits for Jesus to come back, and then you're judged, and then even if you don't pass judgment, you just burn up, and then no longer exist, there's not a really big deal about sin, right? It's like, oh, okay, if this all ends, too bad, right? And you look at others, you might think, oh, I'm saved, and I want to get saved, so I'm going to do this. But other people who don't want it, well, it's not a big deal, because they'll just burn up and no longer exist. And if they die right now, they're not going to be suffering, waiting for judgment, they're, they're going to be sleeping. So it's not a big deal. They're lukewarm. Right? And they think that they're good and golden and need nothing. But he says that they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And like the saying is, they're blind here. And they, they, they condemn themselves by saying that they're this church. They're blind. So they don't see the truth. They don't see reality. They don't see that they're naked. Because right? they're constantly preaching about the law and keeping the law. But they don't realize that you can't be righteous by the law. You can't be justified by the law. That means they have no righteousness. They're like Adam and Eve in the garden. Naked. Having not their own righteousness, not having God's righteousness. But they're blind to see it. And it's strange because Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is the knowledge of good and evil? The Ten Commandments. You go to the Ten Commandments, it reveals, reveals to you what is good and what is evil. It reveals to you your sin. And these people preach the Ten Commandments, but they're blind to see that it's telling them that they are naked and sinners. They're oblivious to it. 
At least when Adam and Eve ate from the tree, their eyes were opened and they could see that they were naked. But these people haven't truly eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They haven't truly eaten from the Ten Commandments and realized that they're sinners. They haven't humbled themselves. They think that they are the rich man that Jesus talked about where he's like, yeah, I've kept the commandments from my youth up. Right after Jesus says it, only God is good. And he goes, okay, if thou be as perfect, sell all you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. Right? This guy was claiming to be perfect, and that's basically the mindset of these people. they constantly telling you to stop sinning, mainly to keep the seventh day Sabbath on Saturday. And you ask them if they're sinless, have they stopped sinning? And they'll either be quiet about it, change the subject, or eventually say no. They're not going to say what their sin is. I don't expect them to. But just to admit that they're a sinner, which they can't do. Right? Because then it makes them a hypocrite for telling you to stop sinning. And you ask them what the gospel is. They don't know the gospel. It's because they're blind. Right? I mean, the biggest condemnation against this church is that they're not saved. Telling you because they're naked means they have no righteousness. You can't be saved naked. You either need to have your righteousness, which is keeping the law perfectly, which nobody has except for Jesus, or you need to accept God's righteousness by faith in the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins so that your sins are wiped out. And now you take on God's righteousness where he lived the law perfectly as a man and you take his life as he took yours. So then you're covered by his righteousness. Now you're clothed and nothing you could ever say or do could ruin God's righteousness. But these people are naked. So they're lost. As Jesus says, he spews them out of his mouth. So they're not in Jesus. And he says he's on the outside, knocking, knocking on the door of individuals. As he says, if any man, singular, will hear him and open the door to him, that's who he will come and sup with. Right? Now, he's not in the church, and the church is not in him, and they're naked. This church is lost. You don't want to be part of this church. It's not something to boast about. It's not a safety blanket. It's just the same thing the Catholics tell their practitioners. You're part of the original church, so it doesn't matter what kind of bullshit we're into, what kind of paganism we were into, what kind of worldliness we're into, what kind of just straight-up sins we're into. You're part of that original church, so it doesn't matter how far we fall and you're part of that. And it's just the same thing Israel did. You're, you're Israel. You're from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're from the 12 tribes. You know, you're of God. God's going to bless you forever. And no matter we fallen away and going after other gods, straight up just worshiping them, it doesn't matter. You're still part of the seed. You're, you know, you're part of the covenant promise, right? It just doesn't matter. And it's that same nonsense. And the reason why... This is going on is because of not knowing the gospel, but not understanding how wretched sin is and that your soul doesn't sleep. And that hell is forever because your soul is eternal. And even though it's going to be destroyed and thrown into a lake of fire and is going to be it's going to die and go into destruction. You don't realize that this is an eternal thing. Look at your body for for heaven's sake, right? Look at it. As you get older, you reach a certain age where things start to get better. It plateaus, and then it just goes downhill. What is happening is that you're dying even though you're alive. And it gets more and more decrepit, where if you were kept alive... Your body just decays more and more and more and more and more. In God's mercy, he allows us just to die. But it doesn't end there for those who aren't saved. You go to hell where you, you have a physical body. Oh, it's a spiritual body, I meant to say, like an astral body. That's just like your body here. And guess what? That continues to die forever. As your physical body does, while you're still alive, it continues to decay constantly. Like, uh, have you ever heard of uh, 
uh, hologram where if you got a hologram and let's say it's the size of this screen we got here if you cut it in half both halves are going to have the complete picture on it right and you cut it in half again this way so you got four panels here each panel is going to have this full picture in it so it's going to look like four screens with this on it right and you can just keep doing that keep breaking it down and it just becomes more and more distorted as you keep doing it though that's what's going to happen to your soul it just constantly degrading breaking apart more and more decrepit but forever I can't remember the actual word for this. They use it for like, uh, kind of like a kaleidoscope thing where they keep zooming in. And it's uh, something to do with a hologram. But they can keep zooming in and the picture never ends. You're just constantly zooming in forever. And that's what it's going to be like in hell. A constant decay. A destruction. And uh, I'll bring up a few scriptures just to wrap this up here. Uh, right here. Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 for the sake of time and just to wrap this up I'm not going to read it you could pause it and read it or open up your Bible and read Luke 16 verses 19 through 31 uh, I think this one says something silly it says here the parable right yet this is not a parable parables are explained where Jesus gives a parable he then explains a parable right this parable is not explained in all the parables, no names are used. But here we have names. Lazarus represents Lazarus. Abraham represents Abraham. The law, the Moses and the prophets, the law represents exactly that. Right? It, it don't represent anything other than what it is. And here we have a story of Lazarus, who God knows, that's why he knows his name, went to Abraham's bosom, a paradise. Like Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Someone else who just admitted that he was a sinner. Right? But where Jesus says, I never knew you, that's why he calls him a rich man. He doesn't have a name for him. He's just, yeah, the rich man. There's no name for him. He goes to hell, a place of torment. This is not a parable. Right? And it's why you ask people, what is the, what's the explanation for the parable? Sometimes they'll give you what they think it means, but it's just what they think it means. They can't show you in the Bible what it means. Every other parable doesn't use names, and there's an actual place in the Bible where you can see the meaning of the parable. It explains it to you. This is not a parable. This is what's going on. Just like we see Revelation chapter 6 when the fifth seal is open. It talks about the souls of them that were slain for the word of God are under the tent. Uh, I was going to say testimony, but I meant the altar in heaven. Right? And they're crying out for vengeance, and God's actually talking to them. So they're awake, they are conscious, they're not sleeping. And he says, hey, hold on, take these robes, which is righteousness. He clothes them. And he says, you got to wait for the rest of your brethren to be slain as well. So there's going to be more to be slain after this in Revelation. But that's besides the point. The point is that they're alive, even though their body's dead. Right? Just like it says in, what is it, 1 Thessalonians 4? I think that's where it says it about uh, Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to raise the dead. And then those who are alive and remain are going to be caught up with them. But it says he comes back with those that are dead. Right? Because they go to heaven. And then he comes with them and gives them their glorified body as they are raised from the dead. And then we ourselves have that happen all at once. Even though we didn't taste death, we shed the physical body and given a glorified body just as they are given a glorified body. As well, and I assume it's made out of the earth, as that's what God makes the physical bodies out of. So, yeah, let's move on to this one here. Jesus, when he died, he wasn't sleeping. Some of these people teach that Jesus was sleeping for three days and three nights. God was sleeping. But here, Peter tells us 
that he suffered for sins once and for all, for the, the just for the unjust. And when he was dead in the flesh, which is died on the cross, he was quickened in the spirit. Quickened means to make alive and to energize. So he was dead in the spirit and brought to life by the spirit. And that's where he preached to the spirits in prison. It talks about those during the times of uh, Noah. So this is where we also read in Ephesians where Jesus brought captivity captive. He went down here to those who were in prison, the captives, and he brought captivity captive when he came back up. He wasn't sleeping. And those that he went and preached to were not sleeping. He went to a place like this here. That's why when he rose from the dead, so didn't a lot of others. A lot of other graves were open because it was a great earthquake. Because he was bringing up Eden, paradise from under the earth, which you can read in Ezekiel, that Eden was under the earth before Jesus died. And then when he gave up the ghost and went down there, he brought it up. And that's why when you die now, you go to heaven. If you believe the gospel, you've been born again, and you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, that is. So, I just want to do this video to rebuke this, because it takes the importance and the urgency to be preaching the gospel, and to be reaching others and to save them. Not that you yourself save them, but you point to Jesus so that Jesus can save them. Because it's not as just that sin's not a big deal. And it's not that they're just going to be annihilated. So, okay, it's not a big deal if I don't preach to them or if they don't believe. No, you got to really get to them because it's going to be eternal torment. You can't just sin and kill Jesus and think, oh, I just burned up for a little while. No, you killed the only begotten Son of God, the perfect, innocent Son of God. That's not some kind of temporal punishment. Something that just, oh, you just burn out for a little bit. No, it's eternal. The same thing try to get across to the Catholics where they think they'll go to purgatory. No, that's a sick joke. Satan is playing a joke on you. So when you go to hell and everybody's suffering and burning... You're going to be thinking, well, good thing I'm just here for a little while. Eventually, I'll pay for my sin and I'll get out. But you can never pay for your sin. You can never pay for what you did to Jesus. You need to focus on what you did to Jesus so that you can wake up out of this and get a fire lit under your ass. Because, geez, this stuff is making you lukewarm and putting you to sleep. Or it's not a big deal. It's like another reason why like the Catholics don't really care about reaching out to other people. They don't go preaching around the world and giving the gospel. They just care about other Catholics and getting into politics so that they can push their beliefs onto everybody else through the government. And, uh, yeah, that's about that. Thanks for watching and take care.